Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Dissidents and Dictators, the flagship podcast from the Human Rights Foundation. My name is Casey Michelle, and alongside my laryngitic co-host, Alicia Maldonado, try to say hi, Alicia. Hello, everybody. We've got a super interesting episode for you today. We are joined by Karim Zidane, our resident expert on all things sports and dictatorships here at the Human Rights Foundation. We're going to be chatting about that relationship and how things have evolved in this space. We're also going to be chatting about why the term sports washing might even be outdated at this point. So stay tuned because we got a lot to discuss. So Elise, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastically. Uh, what happened to your voice? Um, I don't know. It just decided to slowly disappear over the course of two weeks. We had our staff retreat in Austin. I couldn't speak at all. And I would like you to know how painful it was to not be able to sing Dolly Parton's Jolene and our colleague Alex Lee instead talked it out. Yeah, I've never heard Jolene in, in monotone before. Jolene. Uh, Jolene. Like that. Karim, do, you, do you have a go-to karaoke song on your end? I, I guess I've never karaoke with you before. Oh, I'm going to be the one who's not fun right now and say I don't even like karaoke. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Listen, this is an HRF staple now. And, and, and <laughs> I, I assume you say that because instead you find covering and writing about the nexus between sports and dictatorship so fun. Is, is that accurate? Oh, somehow you you managed to make me sound even less fun, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> Way to take that and make it even worse for well, me. <laughs> let's, let's, let's turn the conversation in, in clearly the most fun direction of all and talk about this, this topic. And we haven't had any guests on the podcast before talking about this relationship between sports and dictators. I, I know there are a few folks that are getting more interested in this space, but I mean, Kareem, my understanding is you've been doing this for a long time, even prior to joining HRF as a fellow. Um, how did you get started in this obviously interesting and evolving space? It's it's interesting, Casey, honestly, because it feels now that I talk about it all these years later, it, it sort of feels bizarrely like an origin story of sorts, because a lot of this stuff happens so organically and naturally. I wish I could tell you that, you know, I always had this idea of wanting to cover sports and politics in this intersection. That's simply not true. I mean, a lot of this stuff happened to me, or at least that shaped my understanding of the world, happened to me when I was a teenager. So I'll give you an example. I lived and grew up in Egypt and uh, I had returned from Bahrain, which is where my parents were living at the time. Uh, both both immigrants that were, you know, just, just working there. That's as you do when you're from Egypt at the time, especially the economy was not fantastic. So there are a lot of people uh, immigrating abroad into the Gulf region in particular. So we returned, uh, my mother and I and my brother, around when I was 15 years old. And I really got into football. At that point, I, re I mean, Egyptian pastime, course, really. You can't be a young Egyptian man and not be a fan of football. And I really became a fan of sort of the most popular club in Egypt at the time, which was known as Al-Ahli. Mm -hmm. And Al-Ahli is still one of the most popular clubs in all of Africa, one of the most successful clubs in all of Africa. So, so I really took on this idea of wanting to support this team and wanted to actually attend football games. I had never done so in my life. So I started going to Cairo Stadium and I would go with my cousin, some family members who were part of this group called the Ultras. Now, the Ultras that were attached to Al-Ahli weren't like a lot of the Ultras you might have heard of elsewhere, where they have sort of fascist roots mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. can be very, uh, uh, you know, xenophobic right. and homophobic Skinheads, and stuff like neo -Nazis, that. neo-Nazis, that type of Exactly. Right, right. This was very, very different, really. In, in 2007, the Ultras Ahlawi formed in Egypt, which is funny enough, the year I returned to Cairo as well. So all this sort of is, is, is coming together all at once. Uh, they formed because Egyptian men, Egypt, young Egyptians didn't really have a space to have their voices heard, mm -hmm. really. You were living under an authoritarian regime, a military dictatorship at the time of Hosni Mubarak. Nobody was happy in the country. And... All of us felt like we had no say, no yeah. say politically, no say in the in the socio-economic uh, climates of the country, no say in our own futures. So the only thing we could really do was take part in these football games and chant, chant our feelings at the government. Mm -hmm. And that's all I ever heard at these games was chants directed at the police and chants directed at the government. And I thought that was so powerful. It was so empowering at the time. 
No, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, again, it is these personal moments, these personal exposures and experiences that have, again, set you on this path. I'm sure there are moments when you look back and you say, I, I don't know quite how the hell I ended up here. It's all kind of a series of very strange, almost random events. And yet now you're obviously one of the leading voices in this space. You write all over the place. I think I first started reading you in The Guardian a few years mm. ago when we first, <laughs> first came together. But uh, how does this transition from chanting against the Mubarak government, Mubarak regime, in Cairo back in the late 2000s. How does that transition to you writing about this, investigating this, and becoming, again, one of the go-to voices in this space? So had it really stopped at that, I might have said, you know what, that was just an interesting story that I can tell later. But the problem is, is that while attending one of those games, we were surrounded by cops at one point who started pulling out friends of mine and people from the crowd. We're talking about people who are 15, 16 years old. What God. threat really are they to the government? Mm -hmm. But pulling them out and beating them up with batons right in front of my eyes. And I'm a naive 15 year old at this point who's never seen this sort of violence. To this day, that memory this, that I'm describing right now is vividly etched uh, into, my, into my brain. I cannot forget a scene like that ever. And it quickly told me that, oh, this is a government that's absolutely afraid of us. And let's let's put it this way. They were right to be afraid of us. Mm -hmm. The elders of Halawi at the end of the day became revolutionaries come the Arab Spring in 2011. A lot of those same people who I attended these football games with were absolutely instrumental to helping protesters during the Arab Spring, during those 18 days of chaos in Egypt where people, Egyptians weren't used to street fighting, fighting the police or sort of navigating Cairo's streets at such a period. But the ultras were, they had that kind of experience fighting the police at the time. So they knew exactly what they do. They knew how to avoid, you know, uh, uh, tear gas and how to, how to handle that situation as well. There were, uh, uh, Egypt's first female presidential uh, Candidate Busaina Kemal later claimed that the ultras were responsible for saving her life during the wow. revolution. Wow. That's very, very significant to me. The power of football as a political tool and the power of football fans to voice their opinions and to change the fate of a country in its entirety. And Egypt's not the only example of this, but I got to live and view this example myself. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I did get into becoming a journalist. I, I, I studied in Canada at the University of Toronto. I became a journalist, but my focus at the time really was sports. And I thought to myself, well, you know, let's see what I can do in this world. I really wanted to write for a living. That's what I love mm -hmm. doing. I love writing. And You're I really great at it. You are a very good writer. <laughs> great writer. I appreciate that. Thank you. And that's really what I wanted to do with myself. So I decided, okay, let's give this a try. And let's, start, let's see if sports can be sort of my in into this world. Within a few months of joining a website called Bloody Elbow, where I was writing about mixed martial arts, I interviewed a, uh, a Russian businessman, sort of like a low-tier oligarch, mm -hmm. who was running sort of Russia's oldest MMA organization at the time. And in the middle of our interview, he just stops the interview and through a translator tells me, hey, I like your voice a lot, by the way. Would you like to come do English commentary for us in <laughs> Russia? <laughs> and again, at this point, I'm what, 22, 23 yeah. years old? Yeah you know, wide-eyed, ready to see the mm -hmm. world, and definitely not going to be saying no to any opportunities at that point. So I said yes. Oh. And for the next two and a half to three years, I did so many trips to Russia. I think I did That's 13, so 14 trips Holy back cow. and forth, seeing Azerbaijan as well and Georgia. I went all over the place. In Russia, I went to Ingushetia and the North Caucasus. I really got to see quite a bit of the country, Orenburg, uh, uh, Kazan, all these places that I truly don't think I ever would have visited. It's right. not just a matter of going to St. Petersburg and Moscow. Right. And that period, to sort of sum this up a bit quickly here, that period really was very pivotal for me because it was while I was in Russia uh, that I started learning about how sports and politics interact in this country, uh, the role that oligarchs play in sort of manipulating various mm -hmm. sports leagues. Why are certain oligarchs investing in, say, combat sports. Well, it turns out it's to earn favoritism with Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the story that ended up sort of breaking me into the space and really m helping me build my name was reporting on Chechen dictator Ramzan Kadyrov. Now, Kadyrov at the time was running, had just started, now talk about, again, a chance of fate here. The year I started going to Russia, 2014, just so happened to be the year that Kadyrov formed this mixed martial arts fight club uh -huh. and he was trying to try to get this sort of uh, attention on him and sort of put put chechen fighters into the ufc uh, and at the same time he was actually using this fight club to funnel 
uh, fighters who weren't going to be successful in the octagon into his private army right. at the time, a private army that he's now using in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So this is a story that continued to be relevant years later, and it helped uh, sort of build my name as a journalist and investigative reporter covering the intersection of sports and politics. But honestly, guys, this was not something I planned to do in my life. So, but this was the transition period for you because you were yeah. just talking a moment ago, these ultras are an anti-authoritarian, even mm -hmm. democratic movement on the ground fighting against the regime in Cairo. And uh, of course, we don't have all the time in the world to talk about sports as a democratizing force uh, mm -hmm. uh, around the globe. But now you see early mid 2010s, kind of the flip side of that, the inverse of that, how sports can and have been used as a means to an end for dictators for entrenching their regimes for currying favor with those high, higher ups that are demolishing democracy around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Kareem, you've been working on, on a multi-part series for HRF, a blog series um, on the history of sports washing, analyzing its ancient roots, which I think is so fascinating. Of course, there's popularity among dictators, you know, in the 20th century now. Um, can you try to distill what is a long five part series down kind of succinctly and talk about the ancient roots and all that fun what? stuff? You know, right now it's a five-part series. And originally when I pitched it, it was a three to four-part series. And really, who knows where we'll be when by the time this series is done. Because there are so many fascinating examples, even for me, somebody who's, who's spent so much time uh, sort of in this space at this point, I'm still learning, constantly learning. There's nothing I love more than the idea that I don't know at all. I'm about to mm -hmm. continue to keep learning. At least I find that super fascinating. So it's been an opportunity for me to expand my own knowledge. So I'm really hoping it becomes a resource that's useful to others as well. Because so when we talk about the intersection of sports and politics, it's so easy for people to put out these op-eds and say, and op-eds and just write things like, sports and politics should not mix. Mm -hmm. And then create an ambiguous straw man argument built off nothing whatsoever. But let me give you the proof that tells you that there has been an inextricable link between sports and politics dating back thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing is when you, even when you read an academic piece talking about, say, the concept of sports washing, now to define sports washing for our listeners, sports washing is a term that uh, describes how uh, authoritarian regimes and governments in general deploy sports as a, as a tool to distract from human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. Now, when people started writing these articles about sports washing, including academics, they would give sort of this throwaway line saying sports washing has taken place since the time of the ancient Greeks. Now, that always bothered me a little bit as an Egyptian <laughs> because I and my wife makes fun of me for this all the time, telling me, you know, just because you're Egyptian, you can't just get to say that everything started in Egypt. <laughs> but. But let me make a case for why sports watching and, and, and there's an argument there. The floor is yours. Started in Egypt. Yeah. If you can find an argument for where, for how it predates Egypt, I'm all ears. But the earliest example I have found personally is Ramses II, actually. Mm. So Ramses II used to host these great wrestling matches. And there are hieroglyphs now that show this and represent these matches. And he would bring his Nubian king, so the Nubian king, of course, Egypt's rival at the time in Nubia, uh, he'd bring them over to for the display. So you'd have a Nubian wrestler and you'd have an Egyptian wrestler and they would compete to show supremacy. Now, this was Ramses's way of showing that Egypt was the great and the mighty, because in all these examples in the hieroglyphs, Egypt was victorious. But you should also know that Egypt never wrote down anything that was negative about it. So even the, <laughs> the death of a pharaoh, that's never down in the hieroglyphs either. You just, you know a pharaoh has died when suddenly the name of a different pharaoh is up there instead. Mm -hmm. So Egypt was always fantastic at the propaganda. So it doesn't really mm -hmm. surprise me at all that all this sort of has its roots. Sports diplomacy, mm -hmm. let's say, can have its roots in Egypt. And of course, there are examples from ancient Greece. There are examples in ancient Rome. Rome was well known for the concept of bread and circuses literally using entertainment as a form of distraction and as a way to sort of tame your population. This is something that we continue to see, right? But what I also wanted people to understand through this series, which really takes us through, you know, the modern world into uh, World War I and II and the rise of fascism. Uh, beyond that, the military juntas that, that emerged in the 60s, 70s, and 80s and how they were influential in the World Cup and elsewhere. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about in future editions about you know the rise of, of Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, what Russia's doing in modern times with sports, what Russia continues to do even right now amidst an invasion of Ukraine. 
And then, of course, uh, I'm planning an entire uh, chapter on this, let's say, at this point, mm -hmm. that's going to focus specifically on the rise of sovereign wealth funds as mm -hmm. well, especially in the Arab states in the Persian Gulf. Right now, we're talking the Saudi Arabia's, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar and Bahrain, and how they're utilizing these state funded uh, mechanisms to invest in sports and really create new platforms right. for nation building. Right. Now, the problem is I'm really hoping that this message comes across here is that we really are hoping to go beyond the term sports washing. Now, there's a reason for this. There's quite a few reasons, but it's bothered me for a while that we seem to be able to encapsulate and sum up this very complex concept, very complex concept with a lot of different contexts here into one keyword. Now, I understand how these can be useful at times, especially since sports washing is such a popular term right now. It feels like everybody has understood it. So it served its purpose. Mm -hmm. And let me be the first to say that sports washing still exists. The concept of reputation laundering, that is absolutely a facet of what we're seeing authoritarian regimes do. Mm -hmm. But I make the case now that it goes far beyond that. And as a matter of fact, even historically speaking, different countries have utilized sports for different means. It's not always about distracting from human rights abuses. I mean, mm -hmm. we see that today. How many of the authoritarian regimes that we're reporting on, guys, and that we're writing about and, 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 and creating this activism on, how many of them actually care mm -hmm. about the human rights abuses mm -hmm. being committed? Right. right? Absolutely. So, yeah. So, Kirk, do you have a, a new term you've been toying with? Anything you can preview for, for listeners today about something that may encapsulate? And, and, and I ask that because, you know, I'm fascinated in how this space has developed even since you began covering this. I know you, you just mentioned a moment ago sovereign wealth funds. Obviously, those have exploded, mm -hmm. excuse me, over the past 20 years or so. I did not realize that there was an intersection of these sovereign wealth funds and sports and the, obviously the, the relationship with, with, the, with the dictatorships themselves. How has the space evolved for, you know, if, uh, on your end, as you've been investigating and observing, even over the past few years, are there trends we are still missing? Are there developments we have overlooked? How has this changed even just in the past few years? I think what was really interesting is just, just in the time that I've done sort of reporting. So say I started my career around 2014. So say we've been here for a decade now, mm -hmm. me sort of doing this type of reporting. Well, in 2014, we were at the stage of sports and politics do not mix. That was the primary narrative. So anytime I wrote something like this, people were saying, well, you're just bringing in your own perspective. This doesn't really matter. This is not true, et cetera, et cetera. By 2015 was the first time we hear the term sports washing. It was uh, during a sports event in Baku, as a matter of fact. So in, in Azerbaijan. So we owe Azerbaijan mm. <laughs> and Azerbaijan's authoritarian regime for this sort of term being used to sort of describe what's happening. Yeah, huge thanks uh, to the Aliyev regime right there. Is that 2017? Uh, the Aliyev regime, exactly. Now, that's a regime that definitely was looking to distract from human rights abuses. So I definitely think the term sports washing was very relevant there. And slowly we see the rise of this term. And we see how this term is being applied over the next few years. Actually, articles coming up and saying, well, look, Saudi Arabia is starting this Vision 2030 blueprint, this master plan for its technocratic advancement. This is sports washing. That's sort of what we were getting to. But as I continue to report on these topics, and because I didn't focus on one specific country or one specific sport, really my coverage is on whatever interests me at that specific moment or what I find most uh, relevant at the time. That context matters. Different countries were applying different things. I didn't find, for instance, that Saudi Arabia was really doing this to distract from human rights abuses, especially post the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi. Mm. Now, maybe before that, there was still an opportunity for Mohammed bin Salman himself, while he was on this sort of reform campaign in the United States and elsewhere, presenting himself as this reformed leader, the future of Saudi Arabia, instead of Focusing on that, once it became clear that the jig was up following the assassination of Khashoggi, he changed tactics entirely, entirely. We saw uh, at that point the focus turned towards restructuring the sports and entertainment authority so that you have a sports minister in Saudi Arabia, which he didn't actually have before, mm -hmm. and that you had an entertainment, let's say, czar, and that's Turkey Sheikh right now. He became in charge of bringing in things like the WWE, mm -hmm. these big boxing events, these extravaganza showcases that uh, Saudi Arabia was attempting to host. They started going far more on the offensive, hosting the or attempting to secure hosting massive, massive uh, tournaments like the World Cup, the Asian Championships in football. This 
uh, move on the offensive was really for them to to develop this this nation branding tactic and to also work domestically. Saudi Arabia's intentions weren't just to uh, reshape how countries view them or to or to eliminate this idea that that there was a a, a reputation that that needed to launder. They were working towards nation branding and changing their own perception domestically. Mm -hmm. Now, that's what football really plays a role in for for Saudi Arabia. You have a country that was building its own domestic league, bringing in these massive celebrities into the country, like Cristiano Ronaldo, one of the most famous names in the world, to play in Saudi Arabia. Now, why do they do things like this? Mm -hmm. Again, this goes back to the Rome's bread and circuses, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. where you're distracting and taming the population. And why would you do something like that? Because Bin Salman is aware of things that have happened in Egypt and elsewhere. What happens when you allow football fans to run free, to develop their ideas and to gain confidence of each other and find empowerment in their own voices? He wants nothing of the Mm -hmm. sort. You you have this constant tension emerging in this relationship between sports Mm -hmm. and dictators, sports and politics. Again, it's two sides of the same coin. MBS, again, perfectly aware of the example, just what it was now, 12, 13 years ago that he saw play out with Mubarak doing what he Mm -hmm. can to avoid this. I I wanted to stay on Saudi for for a moment because I think if a lot of folks are kind of generally following the news, maybe they, you know, their exposure to sports washing, for the lack of a better term, these days is because of Saudi and especially Mm -hmm. what Riyadh is doing in the golfing space and in the tennis Mm -hmm. space. Can can you give us a a brief, just kind of 30-second run-through of what Saudi has been doing? And then my follow-up question is, is anyone else, and I hesitate to use the term because I don't want it to have any kind of positive connotation, but innovating in the way that Saudi is Mm -hmm. in this space? Again, obviously, they have deeper pockets than most, but is anyone else kind of leading these new... Mm, uh, you know, efforts, this new crafting, these Mm -hmm. new ideas that we've seen out of Saudi? You asked some fantastic questions there, Casey. So to to summarize what Saudi is doing here, uh, in many ways, uh, this this is an unprecedented sports drive at the end of the day, where what we're watching is Saudi uh, assume complete takeovers of sports, actually, from massive investments in boxing to a creation of a golf league to rival the PGA and then an attempt to merge the two entities together that is yet to be completed, throwing uh, money at the sport of tennis to Mm. sort of take control and to influence the top non-Grand Slam tennis events out there, the what they call the Masters 1000s events. This is very significant steps uh, that very few countries have actually taken outside of the Western world. This idea that you can infiltrate a sport and just throw money at it and that people are going to be lured in by that is a tactic that's really working very well for Saudi Arabia. But this is a long-standing Saudi tactic outside of sports. It's what's called checkbook diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia has long utilized this tactic of, you know, we're going to write a big enough check that you're going to have to come crawling on your Mm -hmm. hands and knees to take it anyway, whether you like us or not. That's something that they've been very, very good at. I say this again as an Egyptian who's Mm. watched this happen to my country and continue to happen to my country. Saudi Arabia buys Egypt up piecemeal. It's that simple for them now. Egypt's in a desperate state. It's a vulnerable country with a currency crisis and, and, and massive accumulating debt in the country. Saudi sees an opportunity sees that vulnerability and takes advantage of it. This is happening in sports too. A lot of these sports are actually extremely vulnerable. I mentioned boxing. Boxing's top promoters refuse to work together. They refuse to come together to make the biggest fights that they could because that's the way boxing operates. It's not just one giant league. You've got a lot of these independent promoters and contractors Mm -hmm. that have contracts with specific fighters and they come together to come to deals for specific events. Saudi Arabia and Turki Sheikh, the head of the General Entertainment Authority, just basically sat down a lot of these promoters and said, hey, look, I've got enough money to make you all happy. Mm -hmm. Let's start working together. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what they did. You've got these promoters who were famous rivals, by the way, famous, famous rivals, sitting together with smiles on their faces with Turki Sheikh just in the middle of them, like the big puppeteer he is now. And they're all calling him His Excellency. That's his Mm. new title in boxing. So he's (laughs) elevated himself. Forget the nation branding. You've got individual branding taking place now. The creation of cults of personalities outside of Mohammed bin Salman as well in Saudi Arabia. That's what just one sport, boxing, is doing for Saudi Arabia right now. Let's not even think about what they're going to get in terms of advantages when they host the World Cup, Mm -hmm. right? 2034, right? 
2034. Right. Exactly. It's not 100% finalized yet, but there's absolutely nothing standing in their way. So Saudi Arabia is a fascinating case study because they are doing it at a level we haven't seen before in terms of the money being spent. Right. But I hesitate to say that nobody's doing similar uh, things in Saudi Arabia. The truth is we're seeing the United Arab Emirates being very, very good at this tactic as well. As a matter of fact, the UAE is the country that, unlike the brash Saudi Arabia, they do things a bit more subtly. Very Let's put it that way. Yeah. They, and, and that almost makes them more dangerous in my eyes. Yeah. A, a few people know, for instance, that, that uh, the UAE completely controls the sports of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Like that's that's I just didn't know that I had no idea. Exactly. And they're in a very good relationship with the UFC right now as well. So combat sports, which again, this sort of hyper masculine activity that really fits into the narratives of a patriarchal society like the United Arab Emirates mm -hmm. as well, uh, and this narratives of discipline uh, and the sport that can be utilized in the police forces and the military as well. Again, very useful for the UAE. They're in implementing this as a part of their own nation branding and their nation building mm -hmm. process. So sports are fascinating. The, the relationship between various sports and authoritarian regimes are so fascinating for a variety of reasons because it goes just beyond the, the narrative of, oh, how are we going to reveal ourselves to the West or what sort of uh, narrative do we want to give to the West? It's more about what narrative do they want to build for themselves domestically mm -hmm. as well now. It's what how they view themselves rather than how others view them. It's and that's what makes it fascinating. Multiple audiences, multiple constituencies. Exactly. From all, it's never just one reason. And again, getting back to why the term sports washing may itself be outdated at this point. Uh, Kareem, maybe just a few final questions. Obviously, it doesn't always work out necessarily for the benefit of the regimes themselves. You know, you and I were talking off mic about the example of the NBA Africa program that has been going on for the past few years and the relationship the National Basketball Association has built up with the Kagame regime as their preferred partner on the continent. Doesn't seem to be going very well from a business perspective. At last check, they had to be bussing fans in just to actually watch while players were not actually being paid for multiple games at a time. Are there other examples that stand out, stand out on your end that have either fallen apart or seen Su uh, sufficient blowback against these regimes that it hasn't actually worked out for their benefit? Oh, that's that's a really, really interesting question. Uh, hmm. I should have prefaced this by saying I was going to ask you about this. I'm sorry for <laughs> dropping no, this. No, no, no. I, I, I love getting questions like this where I, where I have to think on the spot uh, a bit more. I think there's, there's a case to be made that a lot of these countries haven't had it all perfectly uh, go their way. Even Saudi Arabia, right? Like Saudi Arabia could have really done without the Jamal Khashoggi incident, mm -hmm. which really could have been extremely damaging had the WWE not decided two weeks later to return to Saudi Arabia wow. and to act like nothing wow. ever happened. Vince McMahon went to his, his stakeholders uh, in, 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 in a meeting and said, listen, I, I have, have a deal with Saudi Arabia. I'm returning to Saudi no matter what. Wow. Right? Uh, Bahrain is another country that invested so much. We, I even mentioned the UAE saying that they were around doing this before Saudi Arabia, but guess which country was doing it before both of them? And that was Bahrain, Bahrain. this tiny little island <sighs> kingdom right next to Saudi Arabia. This tiny island kingdom was the first Arab country to host the Formula One. Huh. I was living in Bahrain at the time, actually. I went and attended that very first Formula One event in, uh, in Bahrain. Since then, that's become a great example of sports washing because that's what that kingdom was trying to do at that time, reputation launder and develop this sort of impression of itself abroad and create these narratives, or not narratives, create a platform for sports tourism, really, which is what a lot of these countries are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but through the revolution and, and subsequent events, Bahrain has lost a lot of that uh, glamour. Uh, that, that came with hosting these events. They've spent a lot of money. They don't have the resources that Saudi and the UAE have, right? And they're in a situation now where, you know, it's not working out for them the same way it's working elsewhere. It's so funny. I do not associate Bahrain with sports washing. Obviously, Saudi, <laughs> UAE in the Gulf. I, I had no idea that F1 first came to the region in Bahrain itself. Yeah. And you know what? There was actually just a debate happening in the House of Lords in the United Kingdom about sports washing, sports washing as a debate. The first time this ever happened in the House of Lords in the UK. And one of the things they brought up was the Formula One and Bahrain, wow. actually. Wow. So this is a topic, believe it or not, that's quite uh, uh, well discussed in, in the UK. 
Uh, so because of the UK's relationship with Bahrain as well. Of course. Part. And that reminds me of the example in the UK from a few years ago of the now sanctioned Russian oligarch Roman Abramovich mm-hmm. purchasing Chelsea FC, again, bringing things back to football themselves. Uh, Alicia, is there anything you'd like to ask as we round out? No, the I just I think it's interesting that, that you wouldn't naturally associate Saudi Arabia with tennis and Rafa Nadal. It's just um, I, I think it's so fascinating how. They get their tendrils in there and you go, what, what do you care about tennis? But, when you, but when you really think about it, when you really think about it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If Saudi Arabia is trying to build this uh, this image and this impression that it is a reformed society and reformed nation, then a great way to do so is to find sports that are very popular with women in general mm. and where uh, they, they have been known to be very successful. Tennis is one of those sports. And it's a posh so, one too. So it's a it's definitely a great tool for them to push that narrative. They use this. They did the they did the same thing with the WWE because they were able to say, well, look, no female wrestlers have ever competed in the Arab world. Here, come do this in Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. and become the first females to compete in Saudi Arabia. While they'd always pan the camera to the audiences, which for the WWE were sort of family friendly audiences. You'd have mothers and children. You'd have women and men. All this stuff happening in the stands, which you never saw before. In and Saudi of, Arabia. And of course, the great irony is their lack of respect for women in general. And, exactly. of, and of course, many, many of these, especially athletes, are perfectly aware of the regime itself. I, I'm reminded of that, that quote from, um, I don't know if he's still a superstar, but you know, certainly one of the leading American golfers, Phil Mickelson, who was closely <laughs> involved in the creation of the Live Golf Tournament, where he's, I, I, Omar, are we, are we allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah. He's, I'll just read, it's a quote. He said the, the Saudi government is, uh, they're full of, quote, scary motherfuckers, end quote. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, again, perfectly aware of who he's dealing with, and yet at the end of the day, still willing to take the check. So with that curse word out of the way now, Clem, and, I, and I'm sorry for cursing in front of you. I, I apologize again. Look, being a sports fan is difficult enough. It's depressing enough. I can say that as a longtime Seattle Mariners and Portland Trailblazers fan. It's a horrible thing. <laughs> and I wouldn't wish on anyone. Uh, many of the topics you're discussing today are wildly depressing. Again, folks can read about it in the ongoing blog series that we are publishing here at the Human Rights Foundation. Where do you go, Kareem, for optimism? What do you see as reasons for why these actions, these decisions, these new leagues, these mergers, these purchases uh, may not, will not uh, continue in perpetuity. Where do you see these kind of glimmers of hope in the intersection of sports and politics as things potentially at some point go back to where things were again in Cairo in 2007, 2008, and a few years afterward? You know, it's. Uh, I wish I could end on such an optimistic <laughs> note to really say, tell you that there have been, so many, that. There there been so, so many examples of, 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 uh, of hope let's say, but there, there haven't been, especially in the last mm. couple of years, it's been, it's been rough. I'll tell you this, the moments where I, as an individual, as a journalist, as a reporter, as, a, as an activist, as a believer in human rights, the moments where I feel hope myself, I'll give you two. A couple of years ago when I, when I came to the Oslo Freedom Forum, 2022, I, and for, to, to actually uh, moderate a sports washing panel at the time, so that was a great moment of hope because I spoke to so many activists, so many people who are keenly aware of what was going on and interested and wanted to do better. And to sit in a room where knowing that there were so many people actually for a change, you know, this is a very lonely job sometimes, mm. right? And you, we, a lot of us work from home and stuff like that. You really can feel isolated to an extent. And also Freedom Forum was an opportunity not to feel so isolated. And that definitely generates hope. Now, another one was more recent. I was at, I was in Trondheim in Norway just a couple of months ago, attending and speaking at an, uh, an event called the Play the Game conference. Now, Play the Game was fascinating because it was like Oslo Freedom Forum, but more specific to sports. So it was about sports, good governance, etc. All the people who were there were dissidents in the world of sports. Mm-hmm. Let's put it that way. So you've had your academics, all these people are talking about the politics of sports, corruption, sports, sexual abuse in sports. It's just some of the brightest minds focused on the world that I've been focused on for so long. And to realize that there is actually a lot of people doing this in a lot of different languages, all who are keenly aware and supportive and ambitious and empathetic and humane individuals, that mattered, honestly, and that gave me hope as well. So 
it's interacting with other individuals and seeing other people do great work. That's what's giving me hope so far. If you're asking me what governments or institutions <laughs> are giving me hope, oh, I have, I have no good answers for you there. <laughs> we look elsewhere for hope. Uh, of course, of course. Uh, well, Krim, that is uh, uh, still a hopeful note to end on. Uh, we cannot thank you enough for joining us today. Again, where can folks, Alicia or, or Krim, where can folks read more of, of Krim's work? Uh, well, we'll link it in the show notes, but it's on you know, the Human Rights Foundation website um, for the blog series, at least. Um, but also, if you if you Google his name, you'll read a bunch of things. Cream, I'm very excited to attend the 2034 World Cup in a democratic Saudi with you. Oh, I cannot wait. K Casey's giving the optimism, which I just Absolutely. figured out. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kareem. Thanks, Kareem. See you soon. The Human Rights Foundation is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that promotes and protects human rights globally with a focus on closed societies. We promote freedom where it's most at risk in countries ruled by authoritarian regimes.